So I am uh, delighted for your sake and mine that uh, Matt Siegel is going to give us a, a lecture. Um, originally, you might remember, I had Matt down for uh, Emerson and Whitehead. So it's interesting that the same person who can talk on Emerson and Whitehead can also talk on German idealism. This is a, this is a good sign <laughs> of, of scope and competence. Um, so Matt is very good at philosophy, and I want to say he doesn't just have knowledge of the history of philosophy or contemporary philosophy, he actually does philosophy, by which I mean he thinks philosophically. And he thinks not just philosophically, but he thinks in a way that um, <coughs> is an attempt to advance philosophic ideas, philosophic solutions, philosophic, um, not just relationships, but to bring a pattern further. So a lot of people know philosophy, um, but doing it is, is uh, hard because you have to begin with the last really, really smart person finished, and then take it further. Right? So that's kind of different. Uh, Matt is a, uh, as you obviously know, he's a doctoral student. Um, he did a master's, doing a doctorate. He's also working for the vice president. Uh, he's a um, student representative to the board of trustees. He's everywhere. He also, he uh -huh. and his partner Becker run the uh, PCC forum, which is a big success. Third year, fourth year, fourth, fourth year, right? Uh, and if you haven't been. Um, let me recommend it. It's not just nice for content, it's also a nice social event. I don't know where people go after, but I think they go somewhere. Yeah. They have somewhere to go after. Uh, so that's a good thing. That's a lot of people always talking about the PCC community. That's one of the places that happens. Friday night, 6.30 to 8.30, and then after, whatever after me. Um, so that's good. Uh, so in the last uh, class, I was speaking about wisdom, and uh, as my friend Sean pointed out, you didn't include German idealism, uh -huh. uh, and uh, which is true, I didn't, but I should have, I wish I had. Uh, but not to worry, because this is the perfect, the, the, the uh, wisdom and Western philosophy left that gaping hole for Matt to fill. I really meant when I sent you the email saying bring your brain, I hope you will make a extra effort to pay attention. It's actually very hard material. I mean, Aristotle is hard and can't. I can, all the journal ideas are hard, but you can't especially. You might have to close the doors if people are trying to escape. <laughs> no, they're, no, they're not going to do that because it's too obvious they'd be embarrassed. What I'm worried about is that you don't escape, but you just go dull. <laughs> and you say this is for other people. This is for this is for some people who know such things or need to know such things. <laughs> I'm saying no. Stay in there. Philosophy is a spiritual activity. Stay in there. Hang on. Listen to listen to the ideas. And then in the second half we get a chance to ask. Okay. Good. A, a good friend, Matt Siegel, doctoral student and part time. Professor here in uh, PCC. Okay. Thanks. All right. So I wasn't kidding. This is this is hard stuff. Um, certainly, it's hard for me to try to fit German idealism into uh, one lecture for an hour or so, hour and a half. Maybe. Uh, and okay. it's, it's really hard to grapple with the abstract way of thinking, at least of what at first seems like an abstract way of thinking that a lot of these figures uh, uh, express themselves through. Um, but I want to try to convince you that actually their ideas are not just abstractions, they're actually really relevant uh, and important for our political life, for our relationship to nature, the way we conceive of um, the relationship between ourselves and other people ethics and so on. So these ideas may seem abstract at first, but they actually plug into everyday life. Uh, and so I'm going to try to help, help that connection happen. So 
I'm going to offer a story of German idealism, not the history of German idealism, but a story, because there are many versions uh, of, this, of this history that we can tell. Um, one of those versions is, is on the board here, um, which I'm going to briefly go through. It's sort of the standard version of the history of German idealism. Um, and then after we go through this, I'll give you an alternative reading, um, which complexifies things a bit. But we'll start simple, and then we'll move to the, to the other reading. So this is the standard reading of the history of, of German idealism, a sort of dialectical uh, progression dialectical progression from, uh, from Kant with his attempt to put um, philosophy on a more scientific basis. He developed what was called the transcendental method um, as a sort of hypothesis, uh, as he put it in this book, The Critique of Pure Reason, which he wrote in 1781. It was a hypothesis um, that was meant to put philosophy on a scientific footing so that all of the endless controversies uh, of the past could be finally um, wiped away and there would be everyone could agree on uh, what the truth about um, the nature of human knowledge is, what we can know about reality, and so on. So from Kant, you, you know, this grand experiment is, is begun. Um, but then we move on to Fichte and his so-called subjective idealism, his focus on uh, <coughs> the human self as the source of, of, of all reality. Nature is just a projection of the self. And he pushes Kant uh, further than Kant was, was willing to go. Um, but Fichte also kind of came up short, which led then to Schelling, who instead of offering a subjective idealism, offered an objective idealism. Instead of seeing nature as a projection of the mind, Schelling wanted to understand how mind could have emerged out of nature. Right? So it's an objective idealism, a, a, a philosophy that looks at the objects in nature and tries to understand how mind could be possible. Whereas Fichte is uh, looking at the nature of the self to try to understand how nature could just be a projection of it. So, so so Schelling then gives us this other end of the polarity, focusing on nature instead of the self. And then finally, the story goes, um, Hegel uh, was able to integrate the subjective idealism of Fichte with the objective idealism of Schelling to arrive at a kind of absolute idealism, where the difference between subject and object is resolved in a higher unity, a higher identity. So again, it's a story of the sort of march uh, from Kant and Fichte to Schelling to Hegel as a dialectical progression. Where, you know, Hegel admits he couldn't have done what he did if, uh, if Schelling hadn't, hadn't realized what he did, if Fichte hadn't realized what he did, and so on. But of course, this version of the story is, is Hegel's version of the history of German idealism. And uh, when Hegel lectured on the, on the history of philosophy, he, of course, put himself as, as the culminating moment and still a um, century, almost uh, two centuries actually later, this is the standard version of the story that we tell. Um, now, the other version of the story that we might want to tell is instead of a dialectical progression, uh, we could think of this as um, I'm going to use a word that Schlegel, another idealist coined, called sim philosophy. We could think of German idealism as a sim philosophical event. where instead of a progression, what we have is a, more of a, a, simultaneous, a, a simultaneous archetypal field of ideas that um, all of these figures shared in. And in fact, most of them were, were close friends, uh, engaging, um, going to parties with one another, engaging in conversation, working through um, these seemingly complex abstract ideas 
in the context of personal friendships. Um, and they were passionate about these ideas. And if once you start to really study these various figures, you'll see that most of their best ideas were shared. Um, so some of these other figures that get left out of this story are, um, first of all, uh, Goethe, who influenced all of these figures. Not, not Kant so much, but certainly Fichte, Schelling, and Hegel. Um, the Wallace, Friedrich von Hardenberg is his real name. I think his, his pen name was the Wallace. Um, we have the Schlegel brothers, Wilhelm and Friedrich. There are a lot of Friedrichs here. Friedrich Schelling. Uh, I think Hegel's first name was Friedrich. There's Friedrich Schlegel and Wilhelm Schlegel. There's Carolyn, who. Her last name tells the story. Carolyn Dharma uh, Schlegel Schelling. Um, she, I'll tell her story in a minute. But she was kind of the, if you guys are familiar with Lou Salome, 100 years later, she was at the center of um, uh, the birth of psychology. And, and she was friends with Freud and Rilke and, and Nietzsche and um, Doris Locke. And was coming in. Um, so I'll tell her story in a minute. Um, there's Holderlin, the German poet. Uh, there's also yeah, well, we'll fill out one in here so we can get a sense for how you know they were all in this sometimes tumultuous, uh, uh, ongoing conversation. Um, and to try to understand their ideas as though it was some sort of a, a dialectical march to the final culmination in Hegel is to neglect the extent to which um, yeah, all of their best ideas were shared. In fact, I'll read you what uh, Frederick Beiser, uh, the German, scholar of German idealism, said about this. Uh, he says, there is not a single Hegelian theme that cannot be traced back to his predecessors in Jena, which is the city where the university was where they all taught. There's not a single Hegelian theme that cannot be traced back to many earlier thinkers whom Hegel and the Hegelian school either belittled or ignored. So a lot of these figures are part of um, the German idealists, but they're also German romantics. And as Hegel came into his own, he wanted to distance himself from him romanticism for various reasons that I'll get into. Um, so he did belittle uh, those who came before him. Um, so this is the version of the story as a sin philosophical event that I want to tell. Um, sin philosophy is a word that uh, Wilhelm Schlegel coined. He coined another word, sin poetry. And the idea there is, is just that philosophy um, is something that you engage in with friends in conversation, and there's a sort of sympathetic. Uh, you have to be sympathetic as a sort of a prerequisite for being able to engage in, in philosophy in, a, in an authentic way. Philosophy emerges out of relationship, hmm. um, and it's a very different way of, uh, of thinking of philosophy than, than Hegel arrived at, where. He didn't want to even be a philosopher anymore, a lover of wisdom. He claimed to become wise. Um, so, so let's go back for a minute and let's let's talk about how uh, the German idealists uh, why they started thinking about the problems that they were thinking about because the problems they were faced with were given to them by Immanuel Kant. Um, this is the Critique of Pure Reason that Kant wrote in 1781. And I would say that in order to philosophize, if you want to be a philosopher, you pretty much have to read this book. Um, all the great thinkers after Kant recognize this book as uh, a sort of um, 
it's, it's what you need to respond to if you want to claim to have any, any knowledge of the nature of the soul, the nature of the universe, the nature of the divine. If you don't get past the sort of boundaries and limitations that Kant placed on our ability to know reality, then you can't even really begin to philosophize. So you need to read this book, and when you're finished with it, you need to read it again, because <laughs> you won't understand it the first time. Just to add, uh, Martin Buber, Paul Jung, Rudolf Steiner, and Hannah Arendt all began to read Critique of Pure Reason at 14. Yeah. Yeah. I know, I hate them all. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was the collection of essays on the critique, but no. it's the critique itself. It's the critique itself. Okay. Um, so to understand the problems that, that Kant created, we have to go a little bit earlier, just a little bit, back to um, Copernicus, the Copernican Revolution, the rise of science. Copernicus realized that uh, our sensory experience of this, the, the planetary bodies revolving uh, in the sky uh, was misleading, and that in fact, using mathematics, we can discover a hidden harmony that explains their sometimes uh, retrograde movements and, and, and um, otherwise inexplicable uh, movements as we perceive them with our senses. And so he devised this heliocentric model of the solar system that really kicked off the scientific revolution. Um, and this is a, this is a very um, brief and shorthand historical progression to the theist to understand Kant. But after Copernicus, um, Descartes realized uh, that science could not be based on our sensory experience of the world. It had to be based on, on mathematical principles. So following Copernicus, um, he made this amazing discovery about uh, helio, the heliocentric solar system. Uh, Descartes wanted to refound uh, philosophy. In order to do that, he devised this method, which is, is um, it begins as a sort of skeptical method. Right? He doubted everything that he possibly could about his experience of the world, um, because he, he, he surmised that uh, there might be an evil demon who was deceiving him. Um, that you know, right now, all of you might just be uh, robots. And I couldn't tell the difference, really. Um, you know, you know, this was Descartes locked away during winter in a room by himself, coming up with these ideas. So he was pretty alienated from social interaction. And I think, I can tell you're not robots, don't worry. <laughs> um, but Descartes was playing this mind game, creating this thought experiment that really led him to become skeptical of, of all of his experience, of all of the information that comes to him through his body. Um, but he, he finally got back to this point um, where he realized that, that he, was, he was the one doubting all that experience. And that in doubting, um, in thinking or doubting, he came to something that could not be doubted. He couldn't doubt the fact that he was doubting. Right? So his famous statement, I think, therefore I am, he realized that even if there was some evil demon deceiving him, that demon could not say I for him. Only, only he, Descartes, could say I for himself. So he, he discovered this principle of, uh, of the I think, or the, the cogito, um, and used it as the foundation for philosophy, to rebuild philosophy uh, in light of the discoveries of modern science that, in fact, our sensory perception of the world is often deceiving. So after Kant, or sorry, after Descartes, you have a whole series of thinkers. I'm not going to go into them too much, but you know, write their names down. Spinoza, Leibniz, um, rationalist thinkers um, who tried in various ways to get outside of um, you know the famous dualism that Descartes ended up inscribing into uh, the philosophical thought at that point. And then you have the empiricists, John Locke and David Hume, um, who also were uh, antagonistic towards Descartes for different reasons. And I'm just going to focus on Hume because he's crucial to Kant. Uh, 
Kant says that Hume awoke him from his dogmatic slumber. Um, because what Hume did was doing a sort of Cartesian analysis and, and just you know doubting things that we take for granted about what we think we experience in the world. Um, Hume realized, uh, first of all, that this notion of, of causality being operative um, in the physical world around us, around us is suspect because we don't actually um, see or sense or per perceive causation. Um, when one object collides with another, we see a sequence of events, but never do we see uh, the cause occur in our perception. And so Hume says that instead of causation being a sort of principle that can guide science, um, and of course all scientific explanations are based on causality, right? He says, really, causation is nothing more than a habit of our perception. Um, because certain things tend to coincide, out of sheer habit or custom, we accept them as, uh, as, as that, that sequence as always being the case. So the sun rose yesterday, we suspect it will rise tomorrow or, or today. Um, and so all of science really cannot be, cannot claim to have absolute or true knowledge of nature, it just has knowledge that's good enough for practical purposes. Uh, now, Hume also was, was doubtful with this notion that there's some self-identical ego that's behind our experience, uh, the kind of ego that Descartes wanted to, to make as the starting or founding foundational principle of philosophy. Hume doubted that there is such a, a solid, uh, enduring self. He said, you know, when he, when he reflected upon his own experience, it's just a, a stream of different moods, of different perceptions. Um, never was there some solid identity that he could grab onto and say, that's me. Um, so causality, that all-important concept for science, and, and the self, that all-important concept for the new kind of philosophy that Descartes was trying to articulate, Hume said, no, these ideas don't work. They're not as solid as you thought, Descartes. Sorry. Um, so Hume pretty much is an anti-philosopher. He didn't think that we could actually do philosophy in the traditional way that metaphysicians going back to Plato and before thought we could. We can't actually know anything. The best we can do is, is um, through a sort of sympathetic affection for others and through an understanding of, of customs and, and habits, just try to get along in the world and be nice to each other. Um, this was not this was not at all satisfying for Kant, of course. Um, so again, like Descartes, who wanted to put philosophy on a scientific footing, Kant wants to try again. And in order to do this, he has to perform his own Copernican revolution, as he put it. So to, I'm just going to read from the introduction to the critique of pure reason, where Kant introduces his new form of philosophy. He says, up to now, it has been assumed that all of our cognition must conform to objects. All of our knowledge conforms to objects in the, in the outside world. But all attempts to find out something about them, a priori, through concepts that would extend our cognition have, on this presupposition, come to nothing. So in other words, all attempts through pure reflection, through, through pure thought to try to come to an understanding of what's outside us in metaphysics have come to nothing. There's all these disputes about what the nature of the soul is, what the nature of the universe is, the nature of God, and so on. Tell them about a priori. I'm, I'm, I'm a suspicion some people don't know what that means. Yeah. The, um, so Kant, uh, all, all of philosophy really was in, before Kant even, was an attempt to, de, to uh, derive knowledge a priori, which just means knowledge of the world that we can gain through pure reflection without having to uh, consult experience, without, without having to test it or experiment in order to, to know it. It's the kind of knowledge that we just have um, as thinking beings right? before we experience the world outside of us. 
and you know this notion of the a priori will come up again. So if you don't get it yet, we'll keep thinking about it together. Um, so instead of so up until now, it has been assumed that all of our cognition must conform to objects. But this approach has come to nothing, he says. Hence, let us try whether we do not get farther with the problems of metaphysics by assuming that objects must conform to our cognition. So, do you see the flip there? Instead of our cognition conforming to objects, Kant wants to try this reversal and say, well, what if objects have to conform to our cognition? What if the way the world appears to us has to be, is a result of the filtering of our own mind? <coughs> So, in this sense, Kant says, we'd be able to establish something about objects before they're even given to us. Before we even experience the objects of nature, we'd be able to understand something about them a priori. Because we only we know, based on his reversal, that we can only experience objects after they've been filtered through our cognition, through our way of knowing them. So then he concludes, this would be just like the first thoughts of Copernicus who, when he did not make good progress in the explanation of the celestial motions, if he assumed that the entire celestial host revolves around the observer, tried to see if he might not have greater success if he made the observer revolve and left the stars at rest. So, in a sense, Kant called his transcendental method um, reversing the normal sense of, of knowledge being uh, an attempt with the mind, the mind's attempt to conform to objects, instead of making objects conform to the mind, he called this his Copernican revolution. But in, a, in another sense, it's sort of a, uh, a geocentric counter-revolution, because he's putting, if you, if you analogize the human eye to the earth, he's putting the eye back at the center of things, such that all our knowledge of the universe revolves around us, conforms to our way of knowing, rather than us trying to move around the universe to understand it as it existed independently of us. So this is, this is Kant's transcendental uh, reversal that allows him, he, he thinks, to put philosophy on a more solid foundation um, than, it, than was possible uh, before him. So, what Kant ends up uh, doing then is, in the Critique of Pure Reason, he turns reason, or really the understanding, um, it's, it's one of the cognitive uh, powers or the organs uh, of knowing um, that, that Kant uh, marked out for examination. And instead of trying to understand what the understanding, or let's just say the mind can know, he wanted to turn the mind's powers back on itself. He wanted to, to put reason in the courtroom, um, to put reason on trial, and see what it was capable uh, of telling us about the nature of reality. To see what, not what, uh, what, what reality is, but what can we know about reality if we just focus on our own ability to know. Right? So, while philosophers before Kant were really focused on ontology, just unproblematically bypassing the question of what the mind is like and what it is even capable of knowing, they just went straight to, to being, to trying to understand what there is. Kant was trying to take us a step back for a moment and say, well, let's do epistemology. Let's try to understand our own knowing capacity before we then just leap ahead to try to know what there is in reality. And what Kant ends up doing is really severely limiting the power of reason, the power of the mind, to know reality. Prior to Kant, um, at least prior to Hume, who was pretty doubtful of, of reason's ability to know anything, um, classical metaphysicians had assumed um, that we can know all sorts of things about the nature of the soul, the afterlife, uh, the nature of God, um, the nature of the universe. And in this sense, Kant says they were dogmatic. Um, 
they did not have the, um, the perspective on their own knowing in order to, to be critical of all the assumptions they were making as they claimed to have knowledge of God and soul and the universe. Um, so Kant calls his philosophy critical philosophy, and he wants to contrast that with dogmatic philosophy, everything that came before him. So in the Critique of Pure Reason, his first book here that I just read from, in 1781, he says also in the preface that in order to make room for human freedom, he has to limit human knowledge. And why, why would he say that? Well, with the scientific revolution and thinkers like you know, Copernicus, but then Galileo and Newton, you realize that nature seems pretty mechanistic. And in fact, in Kant's day, everyone pretty much took for granted that nature was a giant machine um, and that we could understand it uh, as in a mathematical way as obeying necessary laws, right? So how then does the human being fit into nature if, if human beings have always assumed that they are free and yet our knowledge of the natural world suggests that nature is, is, a, is a big machine? There's a problem here. And Kant wanted to protect the freedom of human beings in order to be able to justify morality, law, society. If human beings aren't free, then there's no basis for ethics, right? So the, the way that he does this is, again, by limiting knowledge of nature, he makes room for freedom. So how does he limit knowledge? Instead of saying that Newton's um, inverse square laws and, and uh, other um, laws of physics that he derived, and Kepler and Galileo derived, instead of saying that they're telling us about what nature itself is, Kant says they're only telling us about nature as it appears to our mind. We can't know nature in itself. Our knowledge is limited to appearances. So, to break that down a little bit more, what Kant does in the Critique of, of Pure Reason is describe the mind, the human mind, as um, sort of two-sided. On the one side, is, is our, um, our intuitive or our sensory experience. Kant uses intuition to talk about sensor, the sensory world, and we have a different meaning for that word usually um, nowadays. But he talks about forms of intuition. Um, and the, the, the two forms of intuition that he describes that human beings have are, are space and time. Space is outer intuition, uh, and time is inner intuition. And he says uh, in a very early part of the Critique of Pure Reason called the Transcendental Aesthetic that uh, space and time, as we experience them, are not outside of our mind. They're just the way that our mind is capable of experiencing the world. Um, they're not, and uh, we can't understand space and time as out there independently of us. Um, but these are transcendental forms of, of intuition, space and time. We, we don't actually see them. Space isn't an object that we perceive. It's the condition for the possibility of objects. So if you look around you, you don't see space, you see, you see colored surfaces. Space is something that we have to intuit, you might say, as what underlies and makes possible our experience of objects. Around us. Similarly for time, we don't experience time, we experience change, emotion. We have to, uh, um, we have to assume that time is what sort of sub subtends or exists uh, beneath the appearance of motion. Right? So again, space and time are forms of our intuition. They're the way that our mind experiences uh, the world. But we can't say that space and time is the way that reality really is. So all the laws that, that Newton devised to describe the physical space to us, what Kant says Newton was really doing is, is describing the structure of our own mind. Right? 
So that's one side, um, these forms of intuition. The other side is, is our, what Kant calls our understanding. And the, under, the understanding comes prepackaged with exactly 12 categories um, that Kant says structure a priori all of our experience of objects in the world. So, you know, these categories are things like substance or causality or relation. Um, and you can't get more abstract than these 12 categories. There's no going behind these categories, says Kant. And everything that we experience in the world can be reduced in some way to these categories. Um, and in our normal everyday experience of the world, we don't even realize it. We think we're just observing the world, but actually our mind has already applied these categories to our experience. So if you think back to Hume for a second, Hume was denying that we ever immediately experience causation, um, that this is just uh, an impression in our mind of, of things that constantly tend to be in, in uh, to happen concurrently with one another, but there's no real foundation for this. Um, Kant wants to say that, well, sorry Hume, but we're not actually even capable of of thinking without already having assumed causality. It's just a built-in concept, a category that our mind has to, to use to think about nature. Um, so is, is this, is this I'm going to stop for a second because I'm about to leave Kant, but I want to make sure that everyone kind of follows what Kant is up to. Is that the start of epistemology? Yeah, you could say that. You could also say that Descartes kind of got things going by doubting his experience and trying to arrive at some, some solid foundation from which to begin to philosophize that he was starting to, starting to do epistemology, you know, turning his gaze back on the mind's own operations instead of just looking at what we can know about the world. But Kant was the one that really formalized it as a distinct uh, part of philosophy. And, so all of the, the 12 structures are a priori? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. We don't derive them from experience, in other words. So we don't learn about causality. We don't learn about substance. Our mind comes, it's, it, it, it comes pre-installed, right? I know you don't like computer metaphors. <laughs> These categories come pre-installed in the mind. Um, which is different from the way that the empiricists would think about them, as just being sort of abstracted from our experience of, of things in the world. Kant didn't think you could get to the category of causality or substance um, just through learning about them from experience. He thinks to even begin to learn, we already have to have those categories, right? So is he saying forget about ontology altogether? study epistemology in order to get there? He's not saying forget about ontology altogether, but he's saying don't be in such a rush to think you can know the nature of reality. Let's first get straight about what knowledge is. So instead of asking what do we know, he wants to ask what can we know? So Kant hoped that eventually once this critique of our own mind, of our own mind's ability to know was finished, once it became totally systematic and we understood all the limitations of our mind, that then maybe we can start to do ontology. But he never finished. And that's what these numbers after him tried to do, to get us back to being able to do ontology again. Not neglecting what Kant discovered about how we know, incorporating it we're going beyond what we call is able to do. Anything else? So, what I was just talking about was all in, in Kant's first book, The Critique of Pure Reason. He wrote another book, um, The Critique of Practical Reason, five or six years later, which instead of talking about um, our theoretical knowledge of nature, 
and how our mind knows nature using the forms of intuition of space and time and, and the categories of the understanding. He wanted to understand practical reason. So theoretical reason is about how we can have knowledge of, of nature, at least as nature appears to the mind. Practical philosophy concerns uh, morality, freedom. Kant wanted to understand how it is that morality can be placed uh, uh, on a scientific basis, uh, that how we can understand the possibility of freedom. So in the critique of pure reason, he wanted to limit our theoretical knowledge so that in the critique of practical reason, he could make room for freedom, right? So what he says about, about human, human freedom is that in order to, to act freely, we have to find a way to step outside of all of our sentiments, our emotions, our desires, uh, even love. An act based on love would not be moral for Kant. Kant's ethics were based totally on duty. And he believed that we had if we reflect on it, we, we experience this sense of duty, you could call it conscience, and that conscience makes, makes demands of us um, to behave in certain ways, and that those demands uh, must, must, in a sense, be an end in themselves. They can't be, there can't be anything in it for us. You know, if I'm going to act morally, um, it's not going to be an action that I do because it's going to make me happy or make me feel closer to someone or um, make, them, make the world a better place. Wouldn't that be nice? No, this is an ethics that's very austere. It's very um, strict. And, and Kant articulated what he called the uh, categorical imperative in this context, which has to do with the way that in order to know that an, an action is moral, in any given instance, we have to universalize it. In other words, if everyone else made the same decision that I'm about to make, what would I think about it then? Would I still think it was good? And if we, in, in that attempt to universalize our own action, discover that, oh, actually, yeah, that doesn't sound so great, then we know it's not a moral act. So freedom for Kant requires that we remove ourselves from Really, everything associated with, with the body, passions, emotions, uh, and even love. Um, so that's the critique of practical reason. A few years later, 1790, Kant published another book, The Critique of Judgment. And the reason he wrote this third book his third critique is because he realized that there is still this gap between theoretical philosophy and practical philosophy. And in the critique of judgment, he's going to try to fill this gap, bridge this gap. And the way that he does that is by examining um, our feelings. He's trying, it's really a critique of feeling, you might say. If the critique of pure reason was a critique of, of our theoretical cognition about nature, and the critique of practical reason was a, a critique of, um, of, our, of our freedom and our, our ability to be moral, uh, our willing, you might say. The critique of judgment was a critique of feeling. And in order to examine feeling, Kant looks at um, aesthetics, the study of, of beauty, um, and he realizes that even though our experience of beauty is often, it's clearly a subjective experience, right, when we experience beauty, he realizes though that we can universalize that experience of beauty. We can say that it's subjectively universal because all human beings have the same kind of mind. And so when one of us experiences something as, beauty, as beautiful, <coughs> we can expect that everyone else will experience it as we would too. Now, this doesn't actually play out in practice, of course. Um, but in principle, when we experience something as beautiful, we expect others to agree with us, right? 
And Kant looks at uh, our experience of nature, and this is a great example of how there are certain things that everyone agrees are beautiful. The natural world um, presents us with many examples of, of, of sort of subjectively universal beauty. And what Kant does is try to suggest that although we can't know scientifically that um, our experiences of beauty are suggestive of some greater intelligence behind nature that designed it, we can't know that with certainty. We can nonetheless uh, be justified in <clears throat> acting as though our experience of beauty reveals to us that some higher intelligence has designed the world. We can act as though that were the case, as if. We have no choice because our mind is organized in such a way to allow us to perceive the beauty of nature, which we can't help but feel is suggestive of some higher, some higher purpose that underlies nature. But Kant wouldn't allow us to know that with certainty. He says, let's just pretend, because we have to pretend that that's the case. Otherwise, there's no way to bridge human freedom with, with the mechanisms of nature. Right? So we, we can't know that nature in itself is mechanical. That's what he proved with the first critique by limiting knowledge. We do know that we are free because we experience it all the time. How do you bridge those? Well, through the experience of the beauty of nature, we can at least pretend, or, or we must pretend, in fact, that there is some higher uh, divine intelligence that understands how freedom and determinism can fit together. The human mind can't understand how that could, how that could possibly fit together, but nature is beautiful, it's suggestive of the divine intelligence, and God can figure that out, right? Yeah. We don't have to worry about it, God will do it for us. That's kind of where Kant leads off in the critique of that. That's, that's his attempt at a solution to bring these two realms, our knowledge of nature and our, our moral freedom, together. Um, are you guys satisfied with that? Can you just well, repeat that thought there? Um, there's some divine intelligence which reconciles the deterministic with the, with the what? With, it reconciles the determinism of nature mm -hmm. with moral freedom. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you took like a kind of like a religious turn at the end of his life or something. Mm -hmm. um, how did he like reconcile or justify that in his critique or his, his synthesis of those two, first two critiques? Right. I don't know if he took a religious turn. It, he always wanted to make room for religion and, and, and God and the immortality of the soul and so on. He thinks that the freedom and immortality of the soul, for example, are necessary for human life for us to organize governments and, and coexist in society. So he took that for granted, that freedom, that human beings need to have some sense of a, of a life after death uh, in order for justice to make sense, because we all experience injustices in our lives all the time. And if we didn't have some afterlife that would reconcile, uh, you know, make amends for those injustices in our life, then people would start to really get kind of upset. It's like his duty thing. He, yeah. Ethics of duty. Yeah, so, you know, again, he wanted to limit our knowledge in order to leave room for faith, to leave room for ideas like the immortality of the soul and freedom, even though they don't make any sense in a scientific, a natural scientific context. Because science is only giving us knowledge of how nature appears to our mind, there's still room for freedom to be possible, even if we don't understand how. That's why he posits this possibility of this divine intelligence and unifying them behind the scenes for us. Yep. Brian and then Robert. So it sounds <clears throat> when you said that he put aside the body, love, feelings, sensuousness, he really left that out of his it's not something that we he needed in his epistemology. And so he gets to this, you, know, you can't really know, but you can act as if. For me, to know something, that is when those feelings come in. When you have an experience, 
that shakes you, yeah. then to me, as an individual, I know, I mean, I can know something. <coughs> right. um, not necessarily someone else is going to know it. So. Yeah. Um, these guys that come after Kant agree with you. Some of them, at least. Yeah. We'll get there in a sec. Robert? And just a quickie. The, um, the beauty that he has in mind, is he thinking of human creation or the natural world? Both. When we ex he says when we experience nature as beautiful, yeah. it's as if nature is a work of art. That's why he then goes to the further assumption that there must be a divine yeah. artist but. who's made nature. Because we know art's beautiful because human beings have created artwork from an idea involving unity and harmony organization and so on. So when, when nature is beautiful, by analogy, we think of, we're led to think of nature as art. And that it has a designer as well. But, I mean, it seems like it's, it's easy to do with nature. Everybody loves the right. sunrise, sunset, or whatever, rainbows. Yeah. But, when, but not everybody loves, uh, say, Japanese no or Chinese opera or John Coltrane. You know, it's just, it's uh, very determined, culturally determined. Kant's not good on culture. <laughs> not Coltrane. He's not good on culture, I said. Oh, culture, yeah, yeah. Culture. yeah. <laughs> I didn't think he was good. He's not good on cultural differences. He's for a white, white, he's a white Kant, guy. everyone should be like white European males. Yeah, so there you go. should be clear on that. East European, East, East German, actually. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so he, so he, I, I, right away, that's an objection to some like, okay. Oh, yeah, very Eurocentric. Okay, go ahead. I assume yeah. as much. No, you. Uh, so this categorical imperative, I remember hearing it a long time ago, like the maximum of your action or something. Yeah. But the way you put it, in order to know if an action is moral, we have to universalize it. Is that similar to like when Gandhi says, uh, like an eye for an eye makes a whole world blind? Like you have to like follow an action through and like, is this, would that be a good example of it? Yeah, I think so. Kant tries to formulate the categorical imperative in different ways. I think he just overcomplicated it, but it's basically, yeah, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. Um, we have to hold ourselves to the same standard that we hold others to, <coughs> is the idea. Right? Sure, I mean, I have to if, if we don't. Right. Yeah, exactly. That would lead us into contradiction. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, kind of going on David's point, so just to kind of follow up, does that mean anything outside Kind of knowledge of appearances would have equal would be equally likely to Kant. No, no. So um, it wouldn't be equally likely. He's not working with probabilities here necessarily, but he does think because of what we can know about the nature of our own mind, as as he's able to dissect it in, in his critiques, that um, only certain uh, realities are possible. So for example, because our mind allows us to experience nature as beautiful, it suggests that uh, nature is a kind of artwork designed by mm -hmm. God. Um, so it's interesting, while Kant wants to limit our knowledge, he also, even in, in limiting it to um, the phenomenal world, as he calls it, the world of appearances, and calling whatever's beyond that the new of the world, he's already said quite a bit about the new of the world. And this is the source of a contradiction that mobilized Victor's response. So I'll get to it in a second. It's kind of funny, it seems like, it's like we have to rid ourselves of assumption in order to make an assumption. We have to rid our, yeah, I mean, but he wants to make a more justified assumption. Um, and it's, it's an assumption that he feels he's justified in making because he's convinced that we need to protect human freedom from reduction to some kind of mechanism. Um, so he, he feels like this is an important mission to find out what we can know and what the limits of knowledge are because if we end up knowing enough about nature that it makes freedom impossible, then we're in quite a difficult, if not impossible situation as human beings. So he feels like he's justified in making sorts of assumptions that he does. And he only makes them after he's gone through this very rigorous critique of what we're capable of knowing. 
So he's, he gets to the very limit of what we can know, and he just wants to make one little assumption, and he really wishes that we would let him do that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not convincing, because if it was, then nothing, none of these philosophers would have thought philosophy was worth doing after him. Oh, I'm just wondering how the Jobin psyche fits into all of this. I mean, the historical Richard, period in which... Sure, well, that, yeah, that's a good question. You know, of course, um, 1790, when Kant published The Critique of Judgment, it was just a year after the French Revolution. And it's often said that what the French revolutionaries attempted to accomplish in deed, in, in action, the German idealists actually accomplished in thought or in spirit. Right? So that the French Revolution throwing off the ancient monarchies and, and um, um, kings and queens that we don't need to listen to anymore, and we're going to, using reason itself, just reconstruct society from scratch, you know, creating a calendar and holidays, and do this in a non religious, non traditional way. In Germany, they're, you know, Germans are more intellectual, more spiritual generally, and they, they, they didn't overthrow their, their rulers in Germany. The princes, sort of the decaying remnants of the Holy Roman Empire in Germany, you know, with all these um, princes ruling over various parts of the land. The Germans didn't try to throw those chains off and reestablish a democratic or republican form of government, but they instigated an internal revolution that rejected the ancient dogmatisms of thought and tried to reconstruct a new philosophy based on freedom. Um, and the immediate experience of the individuals um, you know, encountered with their own mind. So there's, a, there's definitely a similarity there in the French Revolution, but an important difference, which is that, again, it's, it's sort of the spiritualization of the political revolution that happened in France. Can you speak really briefly just about the word idealism and like did Kant coin it or, or like what did it? There were idealists before Kant. I mean, what exactly does it? Um, why is that the best description of these philosophers? So, well, they're not materialists in the sense that they don't think that something independent of the human mind is responsible for giving rise to consciousness. Um, now, there are so many different kinds of idealism, right? Kant was a critical idealist or a transcendental idealist, which meant that his idealism was different from um, Berkeley's idealism. Berkeley was the guy that said to be is to be perceived, so that, you know, we're only justified in saying that uh, reality is, is what we experience, what we perceive. And when we're not looking, the only reason that we can assume, you know, when no one's in this classroom, the only reason we can assume it's still here is because God's perceived it. So Barclay's idealism was that there's nothing outside the mind of God. Um, we are all parts of the mind of God, God perceiving God's self. Um, so everything's in that mind. And Kant wanted to be a different kind of idealist. Um, and he has this kind of not really successful or convincing argument in the critique of pure reason um, in an attempt to justify a difference or mark a difference between Barclay's idealism and his idealism. Kant says that um, unlike Barclay, my transcendental idealism, because of the uh, outer intuition of space, um, makes it such that of necessity I must experience bodies outside of myself in order to experience myself as a body. Um, and in, in other words, I wouldn't experience my own independence as as an organism unless there were other bodies outside of me. So Barclay would say? No, this is Kant. So he, Kant wants to say that, no, there are things outside of me. It's not all just in my mind as I perceive it. Um, but because other people, when they read this book, were saying, oh, you're just like Barclay. You're just an, an idealist who thinks everything's in the mind. And Kant was like, no, 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 you don't understand. I think there is something beyond the mind. It's this noumenal realm of things in themselves. 
that exists beyond our phenomenal experience of the world. So he wanted there to be this um, outside to the mind, in some sense, uh, that we can't know anything about. We can know it's there, but we can't know anything else about it. Uh, so it's a different form of idealism. And we'll see there are even other forms of idealism that we'll get to in a second. So one more, and then we'll move on to Fichte. Yeah, um, just as you described what happened uh, with the French Revolution, and then actually with German idealism, and, and how they broke through. I mean, you're describing the Uranus archetype, which... There was a Uranus Pluto opposition. Well, that's when we became conscious of Uranus. That's, that's when, when they discovered it, yeah. Was it an opposition? Does anyone know? Or a conjunction? It's probably, I think it was I think an opposition. It's opposition. Yeah. Um, so let's try to move on beyond Kant here. Um, so Kant was writing all of his books from uh, Konigsberg. Konigsberg. Yeah, he began writing his books at 65. Right. Before he began writing these books, um, he was he was really more doing natural science and astronomy. He came up with one of the first to come up with the nebular hypothesis and how the solar system formed. Um, he started to, to speculate about something like a theory of evolution. So he was really a brilliant mind, and he didn't start doing this kind of philosophy until very late in his life. Um, you can see his, he was both devoted to science, because he was practicing it, and understood the role of mathematics in giving us a deterministic picture of the natural world. But he was also a very moral person, um, a very responsible person. They used to say that Kant would go for walks, and people would set their clocks based on when he left his house, because he left every day at the same exact time. <laughs> um, you know, so he wanted to reconcile these two parts of himself. This, this extremely austere, moral, self-regulating uh, person with, with this deep appreciation for scientific knowledge. Um, when Kant published these books, it was, they really, um, the intellectual scene in Germany exploded with excitement about this. And the major university where Kant's ideas were explored uh, was, was in Jena, J-E-N-A. And um, before Fichte taught there, uh, some other thinkers, um, Reinhold was his name. It's an important figure to know if you really want to go deep into this. He was the most popular popularizer of Kant's ideas. Um, and he was teaching at Jena for a few years and publishing papers. Um, you know, Kant had a lot of critics too, and you know, he published a, a couple of different editions of the Critique of Pure Reason in order to respond to his critics. Um, everyone was misunderstanding him. Kant didn't necessarily think that Reinhold got it either. Everyone had their own understanding of what Kant was trying to do, and it made Kant pretty frustrated because he didn't think really anyone understood him. Um, so Reinhold was at Jena, he left, and then and then Fichte came uh, to Jena. Only after, well, let me tell you a little bit about Fichte before he got to Jena. Um, he was he was a tutor working for uh, privately for a family teaching their kids and. Um, he was asked to write a review of, of um, the critique, and he read it for the first time. And up to that point, he was really into the philosophy of Spinoza, so he was kind of a determinist. Um, and he wasn't really happy with his station in life, he felt kind of stuck. So it made sense that he would be drawn to this deterministic philosophy. Um, but when he read Kant, he completely turned his life upside down. Uh, and I've heard that he actually walked um, you know, 30 miles or whatever from where he was to, to visit Kant in, in Königsberg and um, spoke with Kant for a little while. Kant wasn't all that impressed uh, with him, but took the left and, and wrote uh, an essay called The Critique of All Revelation. And sent it to Kant, and Kant read it and was really impressed. 
uh, with Fichte's understanding of, of his philosophy. Kant, you know, is like finally someone gets it. Um, so Kant decided to publish this in his journal, and he didn't put Fichte's name on it. He didn't put anyone's name on it. Everyone assumed, though, when they read it, that oh, this is brilliant enough that it must be Kant. And this was may have been strategic on Kant's part because later, after everyone read it and was like, "Oh yeah, you're really carrying this project forward, Kant, great right? work." He's like, "Oh no, actually, this was Fichte." Um, and so uh, Fichte ended up being offered a position at, at Jena University to replace Reinhold as the leading Kantian uh, in Germany. And what Fichte does is while Kant tried to retain this balance between theoretical philosophy on one, on one hand and practical philosophy on the other, Fichte really wants to absolutize practical philosophy. In other words, he wants to make, he wants to say that our theoretical knowledge of nature is rooted in um, the absolute ego, our sense of self-identity and, and the the will that the ego expresses, the free will that the ego expresses. So without that freedom, none of our scientific knowledge would be possible. And I'll give you a flavor for how Fichte approached uh, philosophy. Apparently he was a really intense guy. You can imagine him in a packed lecture hall. He was always standing in the moment he was lecturing the game. Fichte might say something like this in the back of his sentence. Attend to yourself. Turn your attention away from everything that surrounds you and towards your inner life. This is the first demand that philosophy makes of its disciple. Our concern is not with anything that lies outside you, but only with yourself. So when we turn to attend to ourselves, as Fichte asks us to do, what did we discover there? Remember Hume said, well, you we not discover anything but just a sort of stream of perceptions and feelings and impressions. But Fichte says, no, we have to try harder. Um, we really have to make an effort here. It's not easy to, to understand uh, Fichte's philosophy. Because this experience of ourselves as an I, as an absolute ego, um, it's really infinitely difficult. Fichte says, it would be easier to make most people imagine themselves to be a piece of lava on the moon than an I. It's easier to imagine ourselves as a piece of lava on the moon than an I. And why is that? Because normally when we look for an I, we think we're trying to find something that's substantial something that might pre-exist are looking for it. But Victor says, no, the I isn't a sort of ready-made fact like that that we're going to discover inside of ourselves somewhere. It's not a substance at all. It's not a fact. It's an act. Hmm. So when we search for ourselves, it's that very searching, that very striving after the self, that is the self. And so, you know, in Kant, you have this series of dualisms between the phenomenal world and the luminal world, between subjects and objects, where, you know, objects in the sense of something existing truly outside the subject. Um, Kant even has a dualism between the I that I think I am and the I that I am, if that makes sense. So, in other words, Kant didn't think that we could know for sure that there was this absolute ego. He, he said we must assume that it's there, but we can't ever experience it, because Kant denied the possibility of what he called intellectual intuition. Very important uh, concept. What intellectual intuition is referring to is a kind of uh, immediate perception of uh, 
an immediate perception of, of an object that um, that takes place where there's no there's no dichotomy between the concept or the category we have of it in our mind and the object itself as a thing in the world. So Kant will allow for intellectual intuition in mathematics because when you try to create a mathematical shape in your head, a triangle, let's say, the concept of the triangle, imagine it now, the, the concept of the triangle immediately, as soon as you think it, takes on objective form in your mind, right? That's intellectual intuition. The concept and the percept, at least the image in your head, line up immediately. Kant denied that we could have intellectual intuition of, uh, outside of mathematics, of things in the natural world. So if we go back to the critique of, of judgment for a minute, um, Kant denies the possibility of, of scientific genius. So in the context of talking about artistic genius, you know, the way that poet is able to compose some beautiful lines of poetry. Um, Kant says that in doing that, the poet is, it's as if the poet, in a sort of unassuming way, is, is expressing nature, uh, allowing nature to rise to the level of, of artistic creation. Um, often artists don't know how they, they create the beautiful artworks that they create happens in an unconscious way. Um, and you know, Kant says that you can't train a, a, an artistic genius. You know, obviously you need to know certain skills in order to, to be a sculptor or a painter, how to mix the paint, get the right colors and so on. There's a certain amount of training that's involved, but if someone's not already a genius from birth, if they don't have this ability by their very nature, you can't train them to be a genius. Some people are geniuses and some people aren't. It doesn't matter how much training you give them. And the, the artistic genius can't teach uh, their skill to anyone else. Now this is different concepts from the scientist because when, when Newton figures out um, the inverse square law of planetary motions, um, he understands it mathematically and in a step-by-step -step way he can teach someone else how that movement of the planets works, right? He can sort of deduce it for everyone else. So Kant actually said Newton is often called a genius. He wasn't a genius. Because scientific genius is impossible because Kant didn't allow for intellectual intuition um, in natural science. So I want to say a little bit more about, about, about this in the Critique of Judgment before I get back to Fichte. Um, Kant says something very interesting, that there'll never be a Newton of the grass blade. Uh, and he, he goes into biology <coughs> in the Critique of Judgment uh, and basically says that biology can never really be scientific or systematic because it's not mathematical. Um, and when we look at organisms, Unlike with everything else in nature, we can't understand them mechanically. We can't understand them in a cause and effect way because organisms are their own cause. There's a sort of self-organization or circularity to the way that organisms produce themselves. Um, and so Kant didn't think we could ever understand organisms mechanically. There could never be a Newton, there could never be a mechanical explanation for even a mere blade of grass. Right? And so the way this relates to intellectual intuition is, is that Kant denied that a scientific genius could perceive the idea or the concept that is at work to organize an organism. Um, we don't, he thought that we didn't have uh, any way to get our mechanical concepts to line up with um, the, the, the organic concepts that are at work in, in organisms. Fichte and Goethe and Schelling would all disagree with him. They think that through a certain kind of uh, cultivated empiricism or observation that we can actually perceive ideas or forms or archetypes at work in the natural world around us. Um, so one of the 
things that, that Fichte does is instead of, in the way that, that Goethe understood, for example, intellectual intuition, is giving us an understanding of how ideas can be at work sitting outside of us so we can perceive ideas in the world. Kant, Kant didn't think we could perceive ideas in the world, right? He didn't think intellectual intuition in that way was possible, but Fichte had a slightly different understanding of intellectual intuition, which was that we could perceive uh, our own eye in the act of producing itself. So the absolute ego, right, is an act, it's not a fact, but as soon as we try to intuit ourselves, we end up turning ourselves into an object. And so when we, when we engage in this um, self-reflective activity, Kant would, uh, Fichte would kind of agree with Kant that we can't actually arrive at an experience of this absolute eye as an act, because in the act of trying to arrive at it, we always transform the eye into an object. So what Fichte ends up wanting to say is that this the I, I am, that statement, is it's, it's sort of the principle of all philosophy because it's the place where subject and object coincide. It's the one statement where subject and object are clearly unified, right? I am. And from this basic uh, principle, Fichte then goes on to derive all of the categories that, that Kant worked with in the critique of pure reason. But where Kant just assumed them, they were just given, there's the 12 of them, he kind of lifted them from Aristotle, he wrote them down 2,000 years earlier. Uh, Fichte actually, in a genetic way, wanted to show how each of these concepts can emerge from our experience of this unity of subject and object. And I know this probably, this seems really obscure, and it is. Um, I can't claim to fully have mastered Fichte's attempts to develop what he calls the science of knowledge. It's really, Fichte's probably one of the hardest. Hegel's pretty hard too, but. Yeah. Maybe we should break. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You, you can bone up the yeah. way of <laughs> Yeah, let's take a break. Good idea. Just leave. Uh, and that, I, I was once in an informal study group, yeah. Fred Amrine and Arthur Zion studying Fichte. And they thought it was hard. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> okay, we'll put it. Yeah, go to break and then we'll come back. So, uh, dinner. Is that all? It was good. It was good. It was wonderful. I'm glad. I missed you there. I missed you there. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I sent a last I minute in. But, so. I, I, it's a long story why I didn't. I, I wanted to. I'm glad it went well. That's great. Yeah, it was beautiful. It was big. Uh, I'm glad you did it. And I've never really seen There's yeah. no one else here that knows what it is. No, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. It's definitely a spider. used to know, but they've lost it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Hey, how are you? I can't have to play. Good. 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 Yes, it's an ongoing process. Yeah. I think you're, 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 I know you're trying to not pay attention now. Yeah, oh, I, I think, think so. I think it's going to turn. I think it's going to turn. I think, it's going to turn. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think you're doomed, so they'll turn. Do something new this year? Yeah, bad. Oh, awesome. Wow. How are you doing? You're lucky. Well, you? No, seriously, that's tough. Yeah. It's now to learn how to trust the mystery. Trust the mystery? Yep, surrender. That's a good Yeah. I don't mean it like I used to. That's a heavy price. Right, yeah. And daily. Samuel, how are you? So is it the object? You doing okay? Are you making progress with your... The object tires. That's just the ordinary daily stuff. I mean, for your big project. Did you, did you it's talk to? Well, it's the search for 